What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another AP review video for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know on how to help you pass the AP test. So feel free to check out my website, and if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. All right, so let's start with state systems. All right, so our first centralized government Second wave empire, classical empire, that's going to be which empire in the 500s? Persia. Persia, yeah. Start to Cyrus the Great, the Achaemenid Empire. All right, and that is Cyrus the Great coming out of Persia. And uh, that is, I should have a map up here actually. Well, I'll make a quick map. So we've got Europe. I'll do a quick one. Right. We're only going to do the uh, after you erase the old world right now. Americas goes here, but we're just focused on this for right now. Africa's a little out of proportion, but oh well. You guys can handle it. Okay, so Persia is where modern day Iran is now. It's the Caspian Sea, so it'd be in this region ish here. All right, that's where it's going to come out of. Uh, and they're going to conquer into Mesopotamia, a little bit more into uh, Central Asia. And they're going to do very well. They're going to stop by the Greeks. We're not really going to talk about that, but they uh, they conquered quite a bit for their era. In fact, they controlled at one point almost half of the uh, human population of the world. Not the land mass, but the actual live human beings at the time, there weren't that many. And the Persians had, I think, 47 or 44% of them within their uh, jurisdiction. So Cyrus the Great, uh, he's a string. He begins a string of Persian dynastic emperors. So you've got like Darius, Xerxes, etc., like the ones you saw in 300, the Xerxes. Um, Cyrus the Great, uh, he's going to rule as a divine king, like a god. And again, the reason we care about the Persians is they set up that centralized uh, government administration that we, that government still use today, largely. Uh, before, it was just city-states taking over other city-states. They just collected tribute and slaves and things like that. It wasn't very well organized, or it wasn't as organized as it could have been. Persians really, really well organized. So. Their innovation when they take over and incorporate people is, of course, a uh, centralized government. That meant all the rules are made where? Yeah, the imperial city. The imperial city, okay? And for Persia, it was Persepolis uh, and a few others, but we'll just say Persepolis for now. Uh, that meant that everyone had to obey the rules of that uh, central state. So that came from uh, Persepolis. Uh, from Cyrus the Great, or whoever the emperor was at the time, and their uh, orders would go out to these local Persian officials that were like, sort of like governors over their province. What were those called? <laughs> satraps. There we go. So, satraps acted again as like extensions of the emperor. So, you know, in their area, they were number one, except for, of course, the emperor who could call the shots ultimately. All right, so they would carry out orders. They had their own, you know, forces to maintain peace and maintain order, uh, and also to find out what was going on in the air as far as records go. So these are the guys that are uh, in charge of or associated with uh, people who collect information. Did I, did I tell you this already? Which kind of uh, information they were collecting as far as central government goes? Doesn't look like I did. So these are the people uh, in a centralized administration. They kept detailed records of things. So you had like record keepers, tax collectors, yeah, translators, exactly. Now you know what I'm talking about. Translators. And what was the other one? Record yeah, record keepers. Wait. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. See, it's really in the year for all of us. All right. Uh, that was the very successful system they set up that pretty much every government for the most part afterwards that knows about it is going to copy. Uh, the Romans, the Arabs, uh, the Greeks, 
uh, to an extent. Uh, and they do extremely well. And they actually go a step further to make the lives better for everyone else they take over uh, by uh, making it safer. So they keep it stabilized. You're going to have some economic growth. They're going to uh, develop a road system so you can uh, transport uh, goods and people more safely and quickly. And they're also going to um, have a mailing system. So word can spread quickly, people and goods can spread quickly. They're generally safer, more connected, and this is a big one because previously you just kind of accepted the uh, religion of whoever took over you. But what, what was the Persian's attitude towards that? Yeah, tolerance, right, they were much more tolerant. Okay, so they were culturally and religiously tolerant. Religiously tolerant. Right. In fact, they let the exiled Jewish people who were removed from Israel by uh, Babylon, they let them go back to Israel and they let them maintain, rebuild their uh, temple and maintain their uh, culture and religion, okay? So what was the primary religion of these Persians dating back mm, 1500s uh, BCE? Zoroastrianism. Yeah, Zoroastrianism. And that is quite a bit different than um, any previous religions, which were previously about multiple gods. This is about one god. That's called monotheism. monotheism, right. Not only that, though, they added another element in that they required people to, or not they require, their beliefs were set up so that there was this idea of a good side and an evil side. So that the first real creators of that, or inceptors of that idea of uh, this theory of good versus evil, but not just like on a small scale, on like a universal scale. Like there's a, there's a battle that's gotta be tipped to one way or the other between these evil and good forces. And you, as a human, have the choice to live your life on the side of good or, or evil. What was that called, that concept? Free will. Free will, right. So you're not like a pawn of the gods. You actually have some accountability for your decisions and some uh, uh, ability to do what you want to do. All right. Uh, also, they believe that there were consequences for your actions on Earth. What were those consequences? Heaven. Yeah, heaven and hell, right? And lastly, there was somebody that was going to come later to sort of tip the fight one way or the Messiah, other. Messiah. Yeah, Messiah. All right, and these ideas are going to be adopted by the uh, Hebrew people of Israel, Israel, especially when they see how successful uh, and they're so appreciative of, of Persian culture. So they go back to Israel, they rebuild their temple, uh, and Judaism, right, which is based on the Hebrew scriptures beforehand, is another major world religion. That was based previously on the Hebrew scriptures, which are quite old. They go back, I mean, back to the old days of Egypt, like the 3000 BC. Those are going to change, all right? So Judaism is going to adopt a lot of, well, pretty much all of these policies into Judaism. And what is Judaism known as after they go back to Israel and they rebuild the temple? Second Temple, Second temple Judaism, right. So what's the difference then? Did they change their beliefs at all? They adopted the early. Yeah, they're going to adopt a lot of these Zoroastrian tendencies. All right, so Judaism, before they returned from Persia, or from Babylon, was a lot more like the other Mesopotamian religions. So um, if you like look at the Old Testament, what is like mostly the Torah and the Old Testament and the Bible, uh, their version of God before they go back, after Second Temple Judaism, is way more like those Mesopotamian gods in that like he gets angry and jealous and punishes people. Uh, there's a, a fair amount of polytheism, like some of those, uh, some Jews worshiped other gods like Baal and things like that. So it went from a Mesopotamian religion to a very unique uh, monotheistic sort of Zoroastrian model uh, Judaism after that. So that's where the big difference comes. Again, what's that called? We know that term when you take other beliefs, other cultures, yeah, it's syncretized uh, those beliefs. All right, so that's Judaism and that's Zoroastrianism. We'll get, we'll get to Christianity later. You guys with me so far-ish on mm -hmm. Persia? Okay, cool. Who's going to drive out the Persians, though? Rome. Rome. Not Rome. No. No. Rome and, uh, yeah, it's actually, the order is Persia, then the Greeks are going to take over the Persian Empire. Then when that falls apart, that split between the Persians and Romans who duke it out for several centuries until Islam just comes and clears them all out with the caliphate. All right, so 
We got the Greeks then. Um, the Greek states are, we don't need to talk about them that much. They're very disunited. So you've got city states like Athens and Sparta fighting each other and gaining allies. Other city states fight each other. They had the Peloponnesian Wars. We don't really need to know that for this class. What you need to know for this class though is all those Greek city states were united by force uh, by a guy named Philip of Mas uh, Macedon. Macedonia. So Philip of Macedonia. You're like, that wasn't in the reading. You're right, it wasn't. But his son was. So he's the one that unites the Greeks by force. And his son, who you may have heard of, Alexander the Great, right? He's the one that's going to continue conquest outside of um, the Greek states. All right, so in the 300s-ish BC, he begins his uh, undefeated uh, sequence of events, battles, and he goes out and defeats the Persian Empire and everyone within it for the most part. And he goes through uh, lands in Turkey, uh, the Middle East, Egypt, defeats them uh, thoroughly there, chases them all back through Persia, takes over Persia, goes all the way to roughly the Indus uh, River, and then he dies of an illness there, uh, having never lost a battle. Uh, the Greeks, just in case you're curious, they had a very new and, uh, at the time, like innovative form of military uh, formation. They had these, uh, it's called a phalanx. They have uh, shield men and these really, really long spears and cavalry and infantry just couldn't do anything about it. Uh, nobody would figure out how to beat it until we have later uh, cavalry archers, which could just shoot you and you could never catch them. Uh, and the Romans figured out that you can beat them on uneven terrain uh, because they can't form their shield walls well if there's a bunch of trees and hills and if you just kind of root around them, uh, you can actually beat them. But nobody figures out how to beat them for a long time. So. We don't really care about their administration, though. They basically just take over the Persian Empire and continue a lot of the uh, administrative practices of the Persians. The reason why we care about this, though, is they're going to spread something that's going to embed itself here in uh, what is basically the Middle East, Central Asia, and North Africa. Do you guys remember what gets embedded there? What? Close. It's going to be, later it's known as Greco-Roman logic, but it's known as basically uh, Greek philosophy or Greek science or skepticism, like all those, actually really all those things put together. <laughs> so, yeah, I did hear that. I was like, who's doing that? But anyways, so anyways, what he does spread with his uh, cities, mostly named Alexandrian libraries, is he takes Greek knowledge, science, math, philosophy, all those philosophers, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, etc., and their ideas and he implants them here in the Middle East. And the reason why we care about that is later on, when we get to period two with the Renaissance, that knowledge is going to come back to Europe, having been gone since Islam bursted out of Arabia for the most part, uh, and they lost it. That comes back, we have these ideas come back, this skepticism, which we'll talk about in a second, comes back, and it transforms European society, leads to the Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, and the European and Western society uh, are going to explode out of Europe there uh, with innovation, new styles of government, and later imperialism, all that kind of stuff. So I only chose topics that are actually relevant uh, to the development of uh, AP world history after 1200. I'm not just giving you random facts from you know prior to. These are all things that lead to later events that we talk about, all right? Because we will talk about the Renaissance. Uh, we do talk about centralized governments, things like that, all right, and these religions too. So he puts these ideas here, and uh, they're gonna stay there for a while, uh, but again, the Europeans are gonna cut off from those when Islam bursts out of Arabia, which is what we talked about a couple days ago. Uh, they get cut off from that stuff. So what is skepticism? Some of you asked me that earlier. It's kind of simple-ish. It's really a look at uh, knowledge. So, first of all, you question, meaning like you, you try to find the underlying answer. You're not satisfied with a simple answer. Like, oh, it is the way it is. Well, why is it the way it is? Like, why is that cabinet blue? Or why is the sky blue? Or why does the sun go up and down? Like, you're actually looking for the root cause of things, and you're not satisfied with like a flat answer. So, you can prove things, whatever the question is about what something is or how it works or whatever. Uh, by observation, so you test it and see it, uh, or you can use, I guess you could, you could technically say you can use uh, logic to figure out you know, how it would, would work systematically or logically. That's kind of generalizing, but that's basically what skepticism is. So you kind of don't believe what you hear and you make them tell you why, 
right? Or you find out why. And if they don't know, then you do find out. And of course, finding out means proving it through logic, with the use of reasoning, or you uh, use some sort of uh, observation or experimentation to get it, all right? And uh, I know that sounds like, uh, duh, don't we all do that? Yeah, we do, but they're really the first ones to sort of codify that way of thinking and implant it into society, right? That's how we, that's the reason why I have this and this and we have that and all of these things is really because of skepticism. People asking why, figuring out how things work, testing it out, and uh, figuring out how to use them. So that's why that's important. And that one, again, is known as skepticism. Uh, sometimes referred to in this class as Greco-Roman logic because the Romans, when they take over Greece, they just adopt almost all of their culture. It's almost all of it. There's a funny meme. Okay, I can't share that, but <laughs> it's totally inappropriate. But there's a funny meme about the Romans basically walking up and seeing Greek culture and saying, oh, we'll take this, and it's almost all things that are Greek, and they leave back some things that the Greeks are criticized for having that I can't talk about in this class, but uh, that's essentially what it is. So the Greeks, uh, their culture is going to go on. When the Romans come in, they're going to adopt a lot of it, uh, and so that's why we call it Greco-Roman logic, because they're going to continue using that system, that way of thinking. Guys like Cicero, etc., uh, they're going to uh, jump in on that. So. Skepticism slash Greco-Roman logic. I think the uh, summer assignment said Greco-Roman logic, or does yeah, he? Yeah. Or, okay. That's what it is. All right. Yeah, the Greeks and Romans shared a lot of stuff. And then, like I told you guys, when the Romans fell and the Greeks were there in the east, they just kept calling themselves Romans, even though they were Greeks. So they, they do a lot of sharing. All right, cool. Got that. Next up is going to be Rome. They were actually really important in European history and Western civilization and world history, really. Uh, but we've already talked about a lot of the features that uh, they utilized, so we don't need to talk too much about these guys. Uh, what I do want you to know is their basic origin, I guess. Uh, they rose up out of the city-state of Rome. They conquered the surrounding city-states. Uh, they did some conquest into uh, Gaul. Uh, they conquered some of the Greek colonies and Phoenician colonies that were in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, eventually owning the entire Western Mediterranean. But they couldn't go any further without running into a very large and powerful Hellenistic Empire, right? which is exactly what this empire was, run by the Greeks after the conquests of Alexander the Great. So these guys are the Hellenistic Empire or era. And that's roughly 300 to, I don't know exactly what year stops, maybe the, three, the 30s, yeah, 31. BCE, when Rome officially conquers them, at least the uh, eastern half of them. So, like I told you earlier, they figure out how to beat the Greek phalanx by getting it on even, uneven ground and in trees and getting around it and outmaneuvering it. Uh, and so Rome is, after a series of wars, able to take over most of this Hellenistic empire. So up to about here, Rome's going to take over for the next mm, few centuries until about, well, the Byzantine Empire keeps going there for a long time, but uh, this entire empire continues for about four-ish hundred years before the West falls, 500-ish years. All right, over here, though, the Persians take back over. Ta-da! And we have, I think it's first the Parthian and the Sassanid. You don't even know those names. Uh, just know we got Rome over here, and Rome, I'm not going to talk too much about them uh, regarding their state system because it's very, very similar uh, to the Persian system. Centralized government, instead of satraps, they have governors. Uh, they have the roads, they have the mailing system, they uh, utilize uh, minted coins, they set up forts and supply lines. They, they do things very much like, or slightly better versions of what the Persians did. All right, so just know that. Central government, got roads, governors, all that good stuff. The couple unique features the Romans have are, first of all, the Roman citizenship. So Roman citizenship, was new in that when they conquered you, even if you weren't Latin like they were, you were essentially made a citizen of Rome and you had the same rights as those original Latin Romans. All right, so that was unique. They were also pretty tolerant, just like the, uh, just like the Persians, except for one group. They really didn't like one group, well, two groups. They really didn't like the Jewish people because they were so resistant to Roman control, uh, but they really didn't like Christianity. 
And the reason why they didn't like the Jewish people, or at least Judaism and Christianity, is both Judaism and later Christianity, which I'll talk about here in a moment, they both preach the coming of a Messiah, right? They all interpreted that as a military Messiah, like, oh, we're being controlled by Rome, so this Messiah is going to rise up and we're going to kick him out. So Rome interpreted that as a threatening religion, obviously, because they think that it's a military Messiah that's going to rise up and they'll combat Rome and kick them out. So Rome really presses down hard on Israel when they do start uh, rebelling and having uh, various factions uh, uh, like zealots and things like that try to break away from the Roman Empire. Here's Israel, by the way. And uh, Rome gets tired of it, so they decide to Hulk smash Israel. They go in, they destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and they chase almost all the Jews out of Israel. That forces them to leave the area that's traditionally been their home state, and they have to go. But hey, guess what? It's not hard for them to go other places because what are they? The Roman citizens. So where else could they go? Anywhere else? They can go to Sub-Saharan Africa? No, they can't go there. Where else could they go, though? Yeah, anywhere in Rome for the most part, and they do. So you've got a whole bunch of Jewish people that settle along in North Africa, uh, along here in Turkey. A lot of them go to Europe. Some of them also start going into Central Asia along the Silk Road, which I'll talk about here shortly. Uh, but yes, so this is called, I think it's 185. I know it's the 2nd century CE. We'll just say 2nd century CE to be safe. We have the Jewish diaspora, meaning they're kicked out of uh, Israel by the Romans because they destroyed Jerusalem, their temple, and all that stuff. So they have to like spread and wander throughout Europe. So why would I mention this in, in world history before uh, 1200? When, when might this be a topic again later? Think about it. Where'd they go? North Africa, Central Asia, Europe. When do Jews in Europe come up again in world history? World War II. Yeah, even before that too, but yes, certainly during World War II. Uh, we have a lot of anti-Semitism in the years preceding. Now we'll talk about the Dreyfus affair and stuff. But yeah, they come up a lot in, uh, in history, world history, due to the uh, discrimination they had to face. So that's why we mentioned that one. Okay, so that's Rome. Uh, they are initially opposed to Christianity, which I'll describe here in a second. But I'll just describe it now. Christianity. Which, uh, which religion does Christianity come out of? What's it an offshoot of? Judaism. Judaism, right. So Christians believe that this Messiah that was coming was Jesus of Nazareth because of his miracles and his followers. Um, so these are followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Again, they believed in his miracles, his message of forgiveness, of acceptance of non-Jews, all that stuff. Um, he ends up dying, right? And then, you know, Christians say he rose again, non-Christians say he didn't. Uh, regardless, he had a lot of influence. And a lot of people believed in his philosophy and his work and his disciples. So he had several, he, Christianity had several missionaries that were like bent on spreading it to everybody else. Uh, there's two primary ones that I mentioned here, I think, in the notes. Uh, you guys remember them? Paul of Tarsus. Paul of Tarsus, right? He is going to spread that throughout Rome like crazy, right? And uh, it's going to be appealing to people because Christianity, kind of like Islam, I mean, it's earlier than Islam, but much the same. It's very much about giving and sharing and forgiving and like, you know, alms giving, that sort of thing. So who would really like Christianity? Upper class, lower class? Lower yeah, class. well, most people, but yeah, especially the lower class. So despite the fact that Rome was initially going to ban it and literally persecute Christians, um, it's going to spread anyway because of the efforts of missionaries like Paul of Tarsus. I wrote it somewhere. Here we go. Paul of Tarsus spreads it throughout Rome, uh, and so does in uh, Northern Europe here, Western Europe, uh, guys like St. Patrick. So the Catholic Church, well, what becomes later the Catholic Church? The Christian Church and missionaries spread Christianity all throughout the Roman Empire, uh, and it eventually you know, gets all the way throughout all of Europe over the next few hundred years. Islam does sort of chase it out of this region, except for a few remaining churches. In case you guys didn't know, there's, there's actually a few million Christians, like kind of in an enclave in Egypt and like Lebanon and places like that. But for the most part, Islam chases it out of here and it gets stuck up here in um, Europe. So why would we care about Christianity? When's that gonna come up again later? Is that gonna spread outside of Europe at some point? Yeah, yeah it does, right. When uh, exploration occurs and imperialism occurs, especially exploration, 
they're going to spread Christianity all over the New World uh, and throughout parts of the Old World, too. So that's why we learn about uh, Christianity. All right, but they did have a pretty aggressive missionary program, for the most part, uh, which helped spread it. All right, uh, Rome, though, eventually changes his attitude regarding Christianity. Uh, and I think it's 380 or 385, the emperor passes the Edict of Thessalonica, making it the official religion of Rome. Right, that's when they established the Pope and the Vatican, well, not the Vatican City exactly yet, but they have the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. All that begins then, and that officially becomes the uh, religion of uh, Rome. And even after the West Falls in the 400s, it continues uh, over here in the East. What, what empire was that called again? Do we call them anyway? Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, right. Uh, and in a thousand, they split between the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, but we don't care about that right now. We'll talk about that in uh, period, uh, period one. Cool. Any questions about Christianity or Rome? All right, sweet. Uh, let's take a brief break. Uh, so the part that you guys asked the most about is Hinduism and Buddhism. So we'll do that real quick. So Hinduism, that's going to start here in India after a, um, the Indus Valley civilization is essentially overrun by migration, a migration or peoples known as Indo-Europeans coming from, they think, the westernmost or easternmost parts of Europe, this steppe region here, uh, this grassland region. These Indo-Europeans come in, and they bring with them their oral uh, Vedic beliefs, which are later codified, which essentially means, I think I told you guys yesterday, you take all the beliefs and you sort of choose official ones for everyone to follow and sort of write them down in a, in a document. So like, you know, for Christianity, it's the Bible, Judaism, the Torah, Islam's the Quran, Confucianism is the Analect. Um, Vedic religions are uh, written down in several different sets, but uh, you've got the Sanskrit scriptures and the Upanishads. Um, in, uh, I think they're, the combined name is the Vedas, but those are in the 6 to 400s uh, BCE. So it's, it's before or just as Rome is emerging over here uh, in the uh, west. So India, what this is going to do is going to form what's called the caste system. And the caste system kind of sucks depending on where you're born into it because there's no mobility, upward or downward. It doesn't matter how good or awesome you are in life, this system is self-sustaining, you're stuck where you're born forever. Your goal is to try to move up in the next life. All right, so they've got the ranks, we won't write them all. You got the Brahmin at the top, Kshatriya, which is like the warrior class, uh, the king, political leaders, the Vaishyars, the Shudras, uh, and then um, the, uh, at the very, very bottom, you have the uh Did I forget one? No, I don't think I forgot one. All right, so the further you go down, obviously the more demeaning uh, or poor or crappier jobs you have uh, with the you know very bottom being like servants and latrine uh, cleaners which are basically toilet cleaners so um, you're born where you're born whatever family you're born into there you go that's your cast you're done for life or well you're labeled for life anyway all right I can't move up in my lifetime but I can move up in the next lifetime all right and the whole goal is to move all the way up this ladder here or this pyramid to the top uh, and if you are able to ascend when you're at this top position, you theoretically, according to Hinduism, and uh, somewhat with Buddhism too, you unite with the great being or universe itself. Like you end this cycle of rebirth, right? What's that cycle of rebirth called? Reincarnation. Reincarnation, yeah. So in the end, if you get to the top and you fulfill your job, uh, you are going to unite with uh, Brahman or Brahma and become a part of the universe to get out of the cycle of suffering and life and death. All right, so if you, well, how do you move up then? Be a good person? Yeah, you fulfill your class task, whatever it is. Right? Even, they even do like subclasses in there, jatis. But anyways, uh, so if you fulfill your role for your life, that's called uh, dharma. Okay, so dharma is the fulfilling of your class or caste task, essentially. All right, that accrues, fulfilling your dharma, accrues, so fulfill dharma. And again, that's just your class objective, what you're supposed to do, whether you're a, uh, a farmer or a servant or a king or a priest or whatever you are, you're supposed to do what you do the best you can. Even if you suck at it, by the way, even if I'm like a farmer, but I'd make an awesome soldier, and now you're supposed to be a farmer according to your caste and do that. That gets, that builds up your, um, that's fulfilling your dharma, 
which builds yourself up some good or bad karma. karma, right? So karma is not like I did something bad, something bad happened to me. That's not what it means. It's actually applied to your next life. So it's like accruing the whole time throughout your lifetime, depending on your pursuit of this dharma. All right. So depending on your karma, you go up, down, or stay the same. And again, the goal is to uh, go up, obviously, uh, to the point that in however many lifetimes it takes, you get to the very, very top here, and then you uh, fulfill your dharma, get yourself some good karma, and hop on in with uh, Brahma and be part of the universe, essentially. All right. So, I mean, does that do you basically understand how it works? Yeah. All right. There's a lot of details missing, but that's the general idea. Why would some people really not like this system? It takes a lifetime, first of all, but there's no social mobility. You're just stuck where you're stuck, regardless of your your talents. All right. At least how it was originally uh, laid out. So. Basically, anybody down here, which is almost all of people, uh, aren't going to like it. So, as a result, in the six or five hundreds CE, there's going to be an alternate uh, belief system that develops in India. It doesn't stick in India. The Hindu system actually sticks Hinduism, um, but it's going to be popular and spread outside of India. You guys know what that is? Buddhism. Buddhism. Yeah, we'll do that super quick. Buddhism rejects this idea of basically a caste system. They still have, at least to my knowledge, they have some understanding or goal in ending the cycle of reincarnation. Mm -hmm. They believe in that. Uh, but their way of getting there is different. To them, life is, and this cycle is, just constant suffering. You're always suffering, whether you're hungry or you want things or you're sick or whatever. Uh, and to them, the solution to end that cycle of rebirth and no longer suffer and achieve nirvana, as they call it, is to... Uh, Deny yourself all of your desires, so to have no desires, all right? And that usually for them means leading an aesthetic lifestyle. So uh, the goal is nirvana, achieving enlightenment, and ending the cycle of rebirth. And to do that, uh, they're going to deny all desires. So they believe all suffering comes from human desire, wanting things, wanting to feel better, wanting to get more stuff, wanting to have more people, more friends, whatever it might be. So they think, oh, I can get out of that cycle of suffering if I just don't want any of those things. Right? So they stick to the bare necessities. Uh, not to quote the Jungle Book. But they, uh, they're going to um, you know, deny themselves their worldly desires, depending on the branch of Buddhism. There are different branches, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but they may pursue what's called an aesthetic, li an aesthetic lifestyle, which is where they deny themselves all non-necessities. So it's like basic clothes, meditation, Martial arts, maybe, uh, to keep your body sharp, um, but they're not going to care about how they look. They're going to wear the same clothes. They're going to only eat and drink what they make and you know, not desire anything else, essentially. Uh, so that's kind of what Buddhism is. And this is going to be really popular among which kind of people do you think? The lower, the lower castes, exactly. So even though it doesn't stick around in India, because that Hindu uh, system is, the caste system is really well placed, uh, it's going to spread via trade. Um, not over to the west, because we have already some firmly planted religions, but it does travel along the Silk Road into China, it gets into Southeast Asia, uh, a little bit into uh, the Indonesia region, and uh, that's where, oh, and eventually do uh, Korea and Japan too, uh, and that's where it's gonna spread to and remain. Uh, China's gonna give it the boot for the Tang Dynasty, but uh, that's how it spreads. There's one, I think I may have mentioned him, there's one leader, Ashoka, who tried to spread it within India. He was like a big Buddhist, he was the, uh, the ruler of the Maurya Empire for the most part. And he built a lot of stupas, which are like those kind of half dome temples. Uh, in India, tried to spread it, but like I said, it, it didn't stick. But it does leave India and stick outside of India, which we'll talk about a lot in uh, period uh, one. So, do you at least have a general understanding of Hinduism and Buddhism? Yes. Okay. So, over there in China, we have a period known as the Warring States period. All right, so previously China had been united under the Zhu Dynasty, but uh, in the 400s BCE, the Zhu Dynasty fell. BCE. We have the Warring States period. All right, and this is where in China, there's no like one central government or emperor or anything like that. It's a bunch of local provinces and the people there and the elites there that are fighting for control essentially of each other 
All right, that's called the Warring States period. And it goes all the way to, I think, 221 BCE. It's like a 200 year period. It's very long uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, multiple generations in there. Uh, and it is not a good time in China. There's famine, there's disease, there's warfare, there's killing, pillaging, all that kinds of terrible stuff. Uh, and the Chinese are like permanently scarred by this. They have one other instance in like the, uh, the exact years. They're between the Han and Zhu dynasties. But uh, this one's the big one that really burns, puts a, oh, how do I phrase it? Scars their memory, I guess you would say, historically. Uh, and really aligns them with law and order. Because they didn't like this chaos of the Warring States period. Uh, they really enjoy a system and a government that provide law and order. In fact, if you poll people in China as opposed to people here, and you say, uh, which do you find more important, law and order or individual freedom, they find law and order more important. We tend to find individual freedom more important uh, in the West. But anyways, just a cultural difference. So. Warring States period, again, period of chaos, death, destruction, etc., famine. Uh, famine goes hand in hand with warfare back then because most of the battles took place with peasants that would otherwise be working the farms, and the farms also get burned and used by the soldiers and all that kinds of stuff. So war isn't just bad because people are dying in battles. War is bad because you have all of the associated nastiness that goes with it. All right, so during this era, there is, towards the end of it anyway, a philosopher that comes up with a system, a philosophy, obviously, uh, where he seeks to provide law and order through a, a, a belief system, through social harmony. All right, you know his name, right? Confucius, right, said one of you. All right. He puts a lot of, or most of his beliefs and, beliefs and codifies them uh, in a set of documents known as the, I hope you got this right in the quiz, yeah. Analects, yeah. And uh, this system is a little bit complicated for most. We're obviously gonna super simplify it and generalize it, but essentially what this does is it tries to like, it's almost like a three level uh, strategy for providing social harmony for everybody. What I mean by social harmony is like, you have a good a set of leaders who don't abuse the people below them. They listen, and we have law and order. That's what we mean by social harmony, right? So good leaders that don't exploit people, uh, but also followers that are uh, respectful and, and do their part. That's social harmony to them, okay? So it's a system. Confucianism. <laughs> uh, social harmony. And here's how you do it. First step is... As an individual, by yourself, you're supposed to become educated uh, as a good and moral person. So education and seek to become a moral person. So someone who doesn't exploit people, intentionally do uh, sadistic or wrongful things. Like, standing up for yourself is one thing, but sneaking behind somebody's back and stealing their stuff or ruining their reputation, that's another. Right, so, on the individual level, Attention, Education. Anderson, please come to the office. And uh, morality. Anderson, please come to the office. All right, second stage. Does anybody know this one from the notes? Family? Oh, family. Yeah, the family structure, the patriarchal family structure. So this is supposed to mimic society. Right, so it's like a small-scale government inside your home. So at the top, of course, is the, uh, you could say elders, but for the, most part, it's the, for the most part, it's the patriarch of the home, which is generally the father. Right, so you've got the father at the head of the household, much like who in society? Yeah, whoever the government head is, right? Uh, in most cases, it's the emperor. Obviously, in the Warring States period, there really wasn't an emperor, but it's supposed to be the emperor. So the father, you know, and they got the sons and wife and daughters below, and they're supposed to obey their father, but their father is supposed to be a somebody who looks out for them, someone who protects them, provides them, etc. Not someone who like exploits their labor or and things like that, mistreats them, right? So it's supposed to be like a two-way thing. It's like a two-way thing where, again, you respect and I'll say obey, but not like they're your master, but you're supposed to listen to and respect the people above you, be it the father or just your elders in general. And then, of course, those people that are in charge aren't supposed to just exploit you and, and uh, they're supposed to protect and provide for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. So that is, of course, a model for society, which is supposed to function the same way. Right, so you have like the emperor at the top, uh, whatever elites are below him. 
right? Like uh, landlords, uh, people that you know own a lot of property, have armies of their own, etc. Uh, going all the way down to the common folk and down to the very bottom, which would be peasants. All right. Actually, technically in China, the bottom is merchants, but we'll go over that again later. Uh, regardless, emperor and elites are not supposed to abuse and overtax and mistreat the people below them, but in, this, in return, the people below them who are receiving the benefits of protection and civility are supposed to listen to those rules. So, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. That's going to be uh, incepted or invented in the warring states period, or towards the end of it anyway. Um, but before this can be employed in China, uh, one dynasty, one region, is going to conquer the rest in China and start their own very short-lived dynasty of like 16 years or whatever. So what was the region or dynasty that ended up taking over? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually Qin for the Q, yeah. Qin Dynasty. I know it's tough to learn this stuff over the summer when I'm not there to like explain it to you. Qin Dynasty, led by Shi Huangdi Qin. So why the hell would we ever worry about a 16-year-old uh, um, empire, dynasty, right? Or 15, I can't remember exactly how long it was, it was roughly that. So it's not even 20 years, whatever it was. Those might not be exact days, but I think that's roughly what it is. Um, why would we care about this dynasty that lasted just a couple decades? They, they set up the centralized government in China. Yeah, he's going to be the one that really centralizes and establishes like the state of China. That's going to be consolidated by the Tang Dynasty. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but he's the one that sort of unites them again after this Warring States period and tries to unify people through a system of, uh, of, of central authority and laws. So. Of course, he does adopt the centralized government, much like the Persians. Although, by the way, he didn't know about the Persian model. This was their own version of it. Um, and for fear of these local rulers that were once fighting him, uh, banding up against him again, uh, what does he do with them? Did I say that? I don't know. Uh, he starts the building of the Great Wall. Okay, he does do that to protect from northern invaders, and so do the Han. Uh, we got pastoralists, known as the Zhongyu Confederacy up here but we don't care about them right now. What he does, though, is he takes all of those former opponents of his, who are like lo lords of their region, and he moves them to his central capital, Shang'an, like forces them to live there so that they're right there. If he needs to, if they try to do something, he can just swiftly punish them. They're not like miles away with their own army. They're right there. All right, so he starts the capital of Shang'an, uh, moves the elites there, as well as develops written language, uh, comes up with a central administration. Uh, all that looks wonderful, except for his overly strict legal policy. Uh, now, legalism is going to be incorporated into Confucianism, but not as strictly as it's incorporated under the Qin dynasty. So, again, short-lived. They're booted out by the Han dynasty pretty quick, but uh, he's going to set up that sort of lasting model for, for Chinese history. All right. So, the one thing I want to mention, I don't think it was on the notes, but I do want you to know, <clears throat> the dynasty that takes over after him in roughly 206 BCE-ish is going to be the Han Dynasty. And this is the one that helps start the Silk Road, connects with uh, Rome, and all of that lasts for about 400 years or so. Uh, but the reason why we care about them is, well, first of all, the Silk Road connection with Rome. That connected the East and the West for the first time. But also... They're going to be the ones that officially adopt Confucianism. And that's going to, I mean, it's still in Chinese society to, till this day. All right. Uh, it's definitely been whittled away at. But for the next few hundred, how many years exactly? Certainly almost 2,000 years, it's going to be in place, embedded in Chinese society. All right. And the one who does that is uh, Emperor Han of Wu. I think it's on Yeah. He's the one that officially adopts Confucianism. All right. So, do we understand those two early Chinese dynasties and why we learn about them? Yes. Why would we learn about them for world history? We're starting at 1200. These guys are a thousand years or more earlier. Yeah, they established that lasting, you know, centralized government state system that every dynasty is going to adopt and, you know, change a little bit, but also the Han Dynasty specifically is going to adopt and put into place what that's going to define Chinese society for like 2,000 years? Confucianism. Confucianism, right, so that's why we learned about it, all right? 
You guys understand that? Mm -hmm. All right. The other stuff I cut out because we're not going to reference it, so, you know, who cares? Trade routes. That's all that's left, right? Anything mm -hmm. else covered? Okay, cool. So, trade routes. Ooh, I kind of mangled you up here. <laughs> it's been erased. All right. So, several large empires are going to connect here. And when I say several, I pretty much just mean two. Rome and the Han Dynasty of China are going to unite the East and the West the first time. All right, so it's on the Silk Road, but the Silk Road's not a road, just so you know that. It's like a, a general system of paths that a bunch of different people go on. So it's not like you go, oh, hey, here I am in the Qin Dynasty, I'm just, or the Han Dynasty, I'm just gonna pack up my cart and hop on the Silk Road and go over to, to Antioch or, or wherever in the Roman or Byzantine Empire. It doesn't work like that. Uh, the way it actually works is, first of all, again, there's no road. So here, let me get Rome in here. Or the Byzantine Empire, whatever time in history you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> it's more so like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When you connect with somebody else and they take the stuff and then they take the stuff and then you take the stuff. It's definitely not leapfrog. What am I thinking of? Anyway. <laughs> is that how telephone works? I don't even know how that game works. Regardless, that's more so what it's like. So you've got a whole bunch of uh, cities that become very important because they're like, pit stops for these traders, these merchants. And they basically just like, you know, go over here, sell their goods to them and go back. And these guys now have goods and they can sell them if they want. So they can sell them to people over here, or people come from here. And they do this, they make this little network all the way across Central Asia until it reaches the edges of the uh, Roman or Byzantine Empire, gets to Antioch, and then it gets to Rome and vice versa. So that's mostly how it's done. So the traders aren't like Chinese that go across or Romans that go across. Uh, it's a bunch of people in between that go small distances trading the goods and they make themselves all the way over to Rome or China. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So do you think these cities might become kind of powerful and wealthy at some point? Yeah. yeah. They certainly do. We'll talk about them. So you've got like uh, some arc land and other cities like that that become quite wealthy because of all the trade going through. All right. However, this only really works if I've got solid empires at either end. Why wouldn't this work during the Warring States period? China wasn't solid at the time. Why, why does that matter? You're right, but why does that matter? Left Street. Why? Well, that's good. Yeah. So that's yeah. because they're fighting. Yes, they're busy fighting each other and dying or trying not to die. Uh, too busy anyway to like make you know luxury goods because they don't trade food unless it's like rare spices or something that go long distances and not go bad. It's mostly stuff like silk or porcelain or metals, stuff that's expensive that you can you know track and that most people don't have. So trade routes. If there's no solid empires or order, there tends to, those trade tends to drop off, if not completely stop. All right, so remember that. That's a big theme throughout uh, world history. Trade is facilitated or developed uh, mostly when there's con like solid, consistent empires in place. Because again, otherwise people are busy fighting each other or trying not to die. No one has time to make silk clothes and go trade them, all right? They're trying not to die for the most part. You guys got that? Yeah. So we, that's Silk Road. Uh, we also have the Mediterranean uh, trade network, which is really just the Roman Empire, uh, because you are, at the time, connected by Roman roads, and then you've also got you know, Roman ports, and uh, it, it's generally peaceful because the Romans pretty much keep good law and order in that area uh, for a few hundred years. And even when they don't, even when the Arabs take over and then Europe owns half and the uh, Muslims own half, there's still quite a bit of trade going on, at least between uh, each side. So Muslims and Muslims and Europeans and Europeans. All right, so that's always going to be a lucrative trade route. All right, so what are my other two? Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean Trade Network. So let me write those. Then. So you've got Silk Road. You've got Mediterranean Sea Trade Network. And then Indian Ocean one. All right, this one's not going to have a solid empire on it for quite a while, but the local kingdoms and cities and regions are still able to trade on it. So uh, this is where, you know, people of Arabia, like the Omani, later we'll talk about them, uh, the Persians, people from India, Southeast Asia later, later on East Africa, they're all able to trade along the coast with each other, spread spices and cotton and rice and all kinds of good stuff around in there, as well as ideas too, like the the Persian uh, irrigating system, the Kanat system, they're able to spread that around. Uh, rice gets spread from Southeast Asia all the way around. Like all kinds of stuff gets spread 
to this Indian Ocean Trade Network. So two reasons why they could sail this. There was a consistent set of seasonal winds that would take people uh, throughout this uh, western portion of the uh, Indian Ocean consistently every six months. What were those? Monsoon, Monsoon, Monsoon winds. winds, right. So they were able to consistently ride with those winds and connect those trade routes. And also, they figure out how to sail perpendicular to the wind. So previously, if I just had a regular sail, I can only go the way the wind is blowing, unless I want to row, which is difficult. But lateen sails allow you to use the triangular sail to angle, and now I can go three different directions. I can't go directly against the wind, uh, but, you know, look back there, I'm not pointing at anything, just like, I can't go directly against the wind, uh, but I can shift it and go perpendicular, which means if the wind is blowing this way, I can go that way, right? Instead of just with the wind. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. That's gonna help them out. All right, this isn't gonna be connected yet with Sub-Saharan Africa, except through a few uh, networks over here. But there, are, there is some early archeological evidence of uh, trade between the uh, Niger Valley and the Bantu people over here, and uh, the peoples of East Africa across the uh, Sub-Saharan Trade Network or Trans-Saharan Trade Network. Later, when we talk about, well, we already talked about it yesterday, but when we talk about the uh, caliphates in trading, they're actually able to make this connection. Uh, they they uh, domesticate camels and they form these uh, caravanaceri, which are like these pit stops uh, on the edges of the desert and over here in the desert. And they're able to trade directly with West Africa. But that's not till period one actually starts. So that's the trans saharan trade network. It's east to west until period one begins and the Arabs are able to connect West Africa uh, with the uh, caliphate. You guys got that? Mm -hmm. All right. That's it for that topic.